not the usual suspects. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to Silver Screen Showcase. My name is Jared Malone, and I'll be your host as we take you behind the camera and into the minds of some of Santa Barbara County's most talented filmmakers. My guest today is director Tina Love, whose film Destroying Angel has been highlighted worldwide and is available on the internet as well as on demand. Right now, we're gonna take a look at a clip from Destroying Angel, but when we return, we'll sit down with Tina and find out more about her creative process. It's crazy how those stars are already dead, but their light is, we're still seeing it. Their light is shining on us right now. Isn't that weird? Give me that. I don't know, it kind of reminds me of like old movies, you know? How come? Well, you, you just keep watching them over and over again, but all the stars, they're all gone. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or I guess maybe in another dimension. Do you think you can find people in another dimension? You probably have to die to find out. I'm ready to die. <laughs> I mean, I'm not afraid. All right, welcome back. We're here now with uh, Tina Love, writer, director, actress in Destroying Angel. Tina, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm really, really glad to be here. Thanks Excellent. for having me. So Tina, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, originally I was born in Brooklyn. I'm an East Coast girl. I was raised in Connecticut. Uh, kind of had an average teenage life full of angst and I did gymnastics and wanted to be a dancer. Uh, for many years and then I went off to college and had like a journey of other things teaching ESL in Austria and wow. um, I majored in English. It's an English major. Excellent. So that's a little bit my background. Okay, so you know traveling the world, English major, what brought you to filmmaking? Okay, well, I, that's a good question because um, I'm not one of those people who are like, oh, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker since I was five, you know, and I, right. you know, but um, I've been through like many lives and it's taken me a while to find what I'm passionate about. I think some people take longer to find what they want to do. And um, I had a kind of midlife divorce, I had a divorce, and after my divorce, it was kind of during my divorce. I had to think, you know, what do I really want to do? And I took a retreat, and all of a sudden I kept hearing filmmaking, you, you need to do that. And I wanted to go to Vancouver Film School. But then I got back here and everything didn't go as planned, but I ended up going to Brooks Institute oh, nice. in Ventura. So, yeah, and I was there for a little while. I didn't finish the program, but yeah. So was there a day when you were at Brooks and you're doing, you know, still photography that you said, I want to make these photographs move and I, I want to make films? Well, I actually went to the film school in Ventura because they have a film school. Okay. Yeah. So, so it they wasn't just still photography. It was actually Buena Ventura Studios at one point and they bought it and then, you know, they started doing um, the film classes there. Excellent. So, so who, are your, who are your heroes, your filmic heroes? Oh, filmic heroes. I have a lot of them. Well, at film school, we of course, we watched a lot of great, cla you know, older filmmakers, classic stuff. Like, um, I love Fellini. Oh, yeah. And then I love the, uh, cla the neorealism period of Italian cinema. Right. Uh, Vittorio De Sica, The Bicycle Thief, uh, films like that. Um, 
That's another one. John Luc Godard nice. was a big influence. I loved his style, modern, jump cutting, really cool things in his work. Excellent. So that's the older ones, but of course, like modern ones, um, modern directors that I love are uh, Scorsese, of course. Um, God, there's some Boyle, Danny Boyle, Darren Aronofsky. Um, yeah, so I could name a hundred great directors. Yeah, it's good to just get a, a feel for you know who who are your your idols or your muses in the filmic sense. Yeah. You know, you wear many hats, and so you're a writer, director. You know, you you act in some of your films. So, which is your favorite hat to wear? The writer director hat, absolutely. It's my favorite hat. Um, that's what I did mostly when I was at film school. I did a lot of the writing and the directing and, you know, I would kind of take charge and create a project and get people to work with me on it. And uh, the editing just kind of came out of necessity, right? you know, and also I like to have, I'm a control freak when it comes to, so like if you can edit it, you can control it. So Exactly. What do they call that carte blanche in Hollywood or yeah. just a blank check? So that's, uh, you edit the films and there, there has to be this freedom of control, you know, your vision from A to Z. You're not just passing a project along. How does that feel for you? Yeah, um, having that control of like the editing control. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I mean, I love being the edit. I love editing. I mean, it's something I've, I just find it really um, intriguing and um, you can do so much with it, you know. Um, Everything, you can make so many different movies out of the same footage if you really want, you know. You can right. take the same footage and create different movies. And do that with it's music. So cool. The same four chords, you know, half of punk rock is just a variation of those chords, those four. So, wow. you know, that's really interesting, just the, the editing principles and filmmaking. You know, do you have editing in mind when you start a film? Do you... I, I always see the edit, like, you know, when I do my shot list, you know, I'm thinking about the end product that I want. So I think being an editor is an incredible asset to being a you know, writer-director, too, as well. Excellent. Yeah. So right now, we're going to take a look at a clip from Tina's film, Destroying Angel, where the protagonist meets a friend for the first time and learns about the Destroying Angel mushroom. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Destroying angel. Uh, you don't want to eat this. <laughs> okay, so how do I tell if it's the good guy or the bad guy? White gills? Yeah. Free or attached? See? White cap, white free gills. Forget it. It's very possible that it's a nominee to Okriata. Well, let me check. Some guy died last year eating a plate full of these things. Wow. It really does look like an angel in this picture. I have chanterelles here. So. Why would you want to waste your time playing Russian roulette with a white mushroom that can send you down a rabbit hole you probably will never come out of? Mm. What? In fact, I'll cook them for you. Oh, really? Dinner tonight? Okay. Seven o'clock. Seven it is. That was amazing. So, you know, there's always a moment in a film where you hear the title of the film and you make that connection as, a, you know, a spectator that, oh, that's what this means. Uh, how did you choose the concept of, of a destroying angel mushroom? Um, well, I read an article in the, in the paper about some, a fellow who had, an Italian guy who went mushroom hunting and he ate his, he cooked them all up and he died. Someone in Santa Barbara, actually. Oh, wow. And, um, I was like trying to come up with the theme of this movie, which originally started as a comedy about a woman who had amnesia. <laughs> And it evolved into that movie. It's a big evolutionary process sometimes when I'm writing a script where I'm going to go with it. Right. Um, but the whole death aspect, you know, the, the destroying angel, um, 
it works on two levels in this film. It works on the level of the mushroom itself. That's, its, that's the common name mm -hmm. for the Amanita Okreata. And then also the destroying angel is like the death angel, you know, who t you know the one taking you to the other side, right. that angel. Or on another deeper subtextual level, it's the dark side, um, like the, the yeah the the dark angel, right? Because you know, she takes her own life. I don't judge her. I don't judge that at all. I mean, it's not about that. This film is not about that at all. Right. But um, death and life are two sides of the same coin, and that's what I was exploring in the film. Right. You definitely can't have one without the other in this world, and you know, uh, seeing. Um, Santa Ynez River Wilderness is where I learned about what a destroying angel was. And so even watching the film, I didn't quite make that connection. And then it, it dawned on me midway into the film. So Tina, can you tell me, who is Michael Love? Who is Michael Love? Oh, well, he's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> my, you know, my partner, my husband, we work together on projects. Um, he's, you know, he's... He's a screenwriter mostly, right? But he um, he loves he's a musician. He loves music. He's a kind of a closet musician. Nice. Um, but yeah, I met him. I hired him. That's how I first met him. Uh, while I was at Brooks, actually, he had an ad in the Independent as a screenwriting help for screenwriting help. Okay. So I hired him to help me with some scripts I had, huh. and um, he's a great script doctor. Like he took, he he just gave me some thoughts about move this here, move that here. It heightens the drama, and it was like bam, he made them so. Just the notes he gave me were great. So excellent. And uh, how involved was Michael with the script writing process uh, for Destroying Angel? Um, he didn't do anything on Destroying Angel. You know, it, it, <laughs> you it know, shows because didn't. it's it's a very feminine film. You know, and it would be hard to write that as a man, I would imagine. I've never written it for a protagonist that was female. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, you're kind of part of an elite club of female filmmakers that's very low in numbers. So how does that feel? Um, I don't know. I don't think about it too much. I just do what I want to do. And I wish there were more female filmmakers. Um, what's... Interesting is I think there are more coming out now, more director um, women coming out. Mm -hmm. I guess at the Tribeca Film Festival, a fourth of their movies were female directed this year. Nice. So that was a nice thing to see happening. Okay. Yeah. And how is the collaboration working with your husband as a filmmaker? I know Alfred Hitchcock and his wife was kind of a director, editor, you know, on and off, and it wasn't really easy to tell who wore the hat in that. And then Christopher Nolan, you know, of the Batman and Memento, he, he and his wife, editor, director, team. So, um, are there any are there times where you're saying, you know, we're husband and wife now, or right now we're coworkers? You know, it's the line of, you know, like the people who you aren't married to. There's a line that you don't cross, but when you're married, sometimes you're like, hey, how, I can't believe you forgot the batteries. You know, like, <laughs> God. <laughs> How lame, you know, and like you would never do that to someone else. <laughs> right. I mean, maybe some people would, but it's it can be tense, it can be stressful, you know. Um, but we have fun. That's the key, is we really have a lot of fun together creating these things. We really, it's a, you know, it's a collaboration. And yeah, especially the editing can be funny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Christopher Nolan was on the red carpet a couple years back when he was here at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Oh, yeah, I remember. And he was asked, um, who is the most undercredited person in a film, making a film? And he looked back and he said, that's a really interesting question. He said, you know, it's the editors. The I editors, agree 100%, totally. They don't get enough they credit don't. in this industry. And, no, you know, don't. you are... a Co you know, a, a big part of editing for Michael's films, and yes, that's, yes, uh, yes, they don't get enough credit. <laughs> exactly. So I, I thought of you two in that situation, and it's just, it's really cool. How, do you attribute? Uh, well, you any... know, especially with a dro documentary, because a lot of the structure comes in the post right. for the documentary. Yeah. You know, 
can definitely go out with something in mind where you're filming and it doesn't always happen the way you want it to and it's really the job of the editor to create a story from a story that you thought you had and which really became another thing like uh, Flattery and Nanak of the North. He went up there, you know, the first documentary ever made. He went up there to the, you know, Greenland or Iceland with the, mm -hmm. with the Eskimos up there and they didn't really know what they were trying to do and they did something completely different. So, yeah, I, I can notice. Well, with uh, docs, that's bound to happen. Right? You know, like you chasing one story and then something else happens and then before you know it, it's not the story you started with. I mean, it happens a lot. Definitely. All right. Well, right now we're going to take another look at a clip. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk with Tina some more. So what are you planning on doing with a master's degree in mycology? You look pretty good, in spite of the vegetable oil. I'll jump off that bridge when I get there. You mean cross it? Same thing. You must have some kind of plan, right? You know, honestly, my interest in mushrooms really have nothing to do with the culinary. Probably might bore you. Try me. Huh. Okay. How about if I told you that by engaging fungi, we can save our lives, restore ecosystems, and transform even other planets? Morals on Mars. Oh yeah, that's totally boring. What? I'm serious. We can terraform other planets on, in our galaxy by sowing a mix of fungal spores and other seeds to create an ecological footprint on a new planet. Mycelium fungi can be used to clean polluted soil from toxic waste and dangerous bacteria. To create ecologically friendly insecticide, treat smallpox and flu viruses. I mean, we can even use it to create fuel. I'm sorry. It's not that this isn't interesting. It's actually really fascinating, but I, um, I have this ulcer thing. It sometimes acts up. I've, I'm gonna... Is there anything I can do? No, no, thank you. Thank you for dinner. Um, good night. Good night. All right. So this film is just so powerful on many different levels, but what I've wanted to kind of ask you for a while now is how much of Tina Love is, are, are in your films? Well, that's a good question. Um, there is a lot of me in my films, actually. I mean, you can only write from your own experience, otherwise you're copying something, other experience that you've seen or, you know. One thing I do when I'm making something, I'm in the process of making a movie, is I listen a lot to what's going on in, in my life, in my environment, and people start telling me stories, you know, like, and I'm like, and it always tends to have a relationship to the project I'm working on. Um, it's, you know, like this one, I was working on writing this one, and I ran into someone who told me a story about their, someone who lost a child, eating pills that her husband dropped and, or left. And I'm like, wow, okay, I could tie that in. That would be a good way to have that accident happen. And, um, and then there's my own personal existential angst is also in the film. You know, this whole thing of, the whole movie is in kind of a, about de death and like how we humans have come up with stories about dying, you know, like, we have to console ourselves with stories about an afterlife. That's what the stories at the end are. She's telling her daughter. Um, you know, we can't seem to embrace the idea of oblivion or like annihilation, our own annihilation. So, and I had to come to terms with that myself, you know, and thinking about it. And that's what this movie is kind of dealing with. Um, death is a part of life. Yes. It was part of the design, and I grew up Catholic. So death was always seen as a mistake, some sort of accidental thing that humans caused. Right. It's all our fault. You know, that's the feeling you get from growing up in the Catholic Church. And I'm like, well, I finally got out of that thinking, you know, and I got to this point where I'm like, death is in the design. 
you know, it's part of it. God obviously intended it, and it was no accident. So that's why I was grappling with that and coming to terms with it and embracing that. Definitely. You know. So your stepdaughter is an actress in this film. How was that uh, Oh, uh, my niece. Oh, okay, my niece right, is niece. the... He's, she's actually Michael's niece, uh, Jessica Love. Okay, Jessica Love. Yeah. She's a, a Juilliard drama school graduate. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, I really want to use the family talent. <laughs> so she came and I got, I got her a plane ticket out and she came and did, the, did it for me. And she's a very professional, you know, just really was working on the part and reading stories of mothers, <laughs> sad stories and right, very... Yeah. She's wonderful. It was very emotional. Yeah. So, how is the casting process in your films with a local filmmaker? How, how do you find your actors? Um, do you have any particular places in the county that you like to shoot that they're just like your spots? And um, from pre-production to post-production, what's the average uh, time that is spent on a production of yours? Okay, well, it's all different depending on the production. Like they'll hold it like a baby. We had a casting session like an official casting call. And what was funny is we had all these people coming from L.A. to audition in Santa Barbara for wow. two days. Constant stream of people auditioning, coming to Santa Barbara from L.A., which is totally crazy. Yeah. Um, and it was so fun. With this film, I already kind of knew I wanted Jessica. I mean, I wanted to use her talent. And then I found a little girl who looked a lot like her. Um, I found her. She saw my... I put it up on the bulletin board at the Natural Cafe, okay. and the mother saw it and liked the idea of the story. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then there's another guy in there, the, the husband. He's, um, he was an actor I knew from the past. I just called him in. And then Timo Nunez, Paul, he's a flamenco dancer. Really? <laughs> but I took lessons from him. He was a, a teacher I had. And I knew he wanted to get into acting. He was telling me he liked acting. So I thought I'd use him in it. You know, why not Definitely. give him a chance? So I've kind of noticed some similarities in locations between Santinez River Wilderness and yeah. Destroying Angel. We like to use our backyard. Definitely. Hey. <laughs> Make know. it shoot what you can do on your budget. You know, that's where we're at right now. We have a certain amount of money and we want to make a movie, but we can't. We shoot in our yard, you know. It's all about the script and the story. Excellent. I, I agree with yeah, that 100%. Acting. You know, it's all about the narrative. And um, on the opposite side of that fence, how is it shooting, you know, you, uh, neorealism? You know, you've got natural lighting. You're outdoors a lot. You know, you're using um, equipment out of a studio. How is that uh, with new technology? And what technology do you use when you make your films? Um, well, we use the Panasonic HVX 200A, okay. and that's a great camera because you can do incredible time lapse for you know time lapse video, um, and you can select frame rates, and it's just a wonderful camera okay. that we use. Um, we've got the tripods, we've got some good microphones, you know, roads, and then you need the one the windscreen's really important, right? Yeah. Especially when you're shooting on the beach, we needed the the, the muff on the you know, the, the blimp, the full-on blimp with the mink coat. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I'd like to kind of change course right now and talk about your new project, which is the Red Shoes. Can you tell us a little bit about the Red Shoes? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a, Right now it's just a script, and I've done about four script reads, if it, you know, with actors. And we, so I revise each time, and... Um, this would be the first project that I can't shoot in my backyard, basically. I mean, it definitely half of it could be filmed in Santa Barbara, absolutely. Um, the protagonist is a former spirit of fiesta. Oh, excellent. Once upon a time spirit of fiesta who married a Lutheran minister to get out of a jam. She loved him and she thought, you know, they were meant to be together and God was calling her to come to God, you know, join the Lutheran church. She was at 19. 20 when this all happened and um, anyway she, she decides this is 14 years later now that the movie starts after their marriage and she auditions for the red shoes which is an act of rebellion basically because they had made a deal that she wouldn't perform anymore okay 
So her auditioning for the Red Shoes is her reclaiming a dance career that he had made her abandon because he didn't want her out there performing. Right. Yeah. And so you're now a recent member of Community Film Studio Santa Barbara, and that kind of reminds me of uh, United Artists and uh, Charlie Chaplin, you know, Mary Pickford starting that company back in 1919 a bunch of talented people coming together and making films in their community, which was Hollywood, and now you're a part of, of this film, independent film studio. How can the community come together to, to help you with the red shoes? Um, well, I don't know how the red shoes will be made, um, honestly. I'm, I've approached, you know, people I know, producers and stuff, um, and I would love to get the script to Amy Adams because that's my dream actress for that role. Um, but, you know, that, that's like aiming high. I could also use a lot of the local talent because we have so many wonderful flamenco dancers in Santa Barbara. And then I know some in Spain. I'm pretty connected because I do flamenco as well. Nice. So, but um, the community films, I just joined them and um, they just did a movie, which I saw and I thought it was it was good. It was, right, great, it was really a great first film for them. and. I'm sure they'll go on and do a lot more. Um, but the Red Shoes is, you know, I don't know, I might do Kickstarter, I might find someone who likes the idea. Uh, it's not a remake of the old movie, but it definitely pays homage to the original Red Shoes in it. Right, I've so. seen the original and I, I really love it. I love the color in it, it's just so vibrant with that technicolor. Especially the revamp, the refixed one. Oh, Remember yeah. Scorsese had like raised the awareness to have that fixed because oh, it was, was deteriorating. A, he's and, such an icon when it comes to f not only filmmaking but film preservation and film history. So mm -hmm. I respect Scorsese too oh, yeah. a great deal. Is there a website where people can contact you, Tina, or get involved, volunteer, or just plain uh, help finance the film? Yeah. Um, well, our website is quashtra, pro dot com. Okay. Could, Quash, you, could you spell that? Yeah, really Quastra, Q U A S T R A P R O dot com. It means witch star in Latin, Quastra Pro. Okay. And that was actually based on a sci fi Mike, Michael had written, Quastra. Okay. So we used it. Excellent. Well, Tina, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. And, uh, you know, thank please come you. back and good thank luck you. in the future with the Red Shoes and all of your films. And um, please check out. Destroying Angel on YouTube, it's available. And uh, visit Tina's website for more information. I'm your host, Jared Malone, and you're watching Silver Screen Showcase. We'll see you next time.